I'm Alvin Sequeira, Vice President, um, uh, Security and Network Solutions, which means we try to add security and networking solutions on top of the vSphere stack, and uh, we'll talk about some of those uh, items today. Before I get started, the perfunctory disclaimer, I will be talking about some topics that are further down the road, the vision um, as we go down the road, so um, take uh, all of those comments in that light. But we are also in the process of launching and announcing products. You'll hear about that uh, in the next uh, few days. So um, it's very important. Uh, today at VMworld, it's probably the first time that we are going into security uh, solutions in a serious way. The question is why. And what I want to do is today not just talk about the products themselves, as much as talk about why it is we felt compelled to go ahead and try to release a set of solutions, uh, what's the shortcomings in the marketplace today as we move towards secure hybrid clouds, which you'll hear a lot about as we go forward, the rationale behind them, how it is we plan on working with the industry, with our partners, and creating compelling solutions to accelerate uh, the journey to the secure hybrid clouds. And I will talk a little bit about the products, but there are various other sessions also that will cover products in more details. I will cover the architecture uh, in a bit. Can everyone hear me? Okay. There's still some folks uh, waiting to come in here. So uh, let me talk about uh, security as we move to the cloud. Uh, there are certain important things as you move to the cloud, and it, it, it is clear that current security architectures fall short. If you think about most of security today, uh, not, uh, not talking about operations and management, if you think about how security de is deployed, it's primarily deployed in the network and it's primarily deployed in agents. Those are the two uh, main repositories for security functions, if you will, in a given enterprise. Let's take a look at each of those in turn. Firstly, data center, network-based security. Secondly, endpoint security. And look at uh, what's going on there underneath the cover. If you look at a typical um, uh, deployment in an enterprise, you have users of various sites come in through internets, intranets, WANs, etc., into a DMZ where you have a variety of devices like your port firewalls, your VPNs, your load balancers, and then the switching, you go into your web server farm. From that point, um, you go into the internal network, uh, into your uh, core routers, where you have things like internal firewalls and IDS, IPS technologies uh, sitting in the distribution layer. Typically go from an edge to a core to a distribution uh, and finally the access layer. In today's world with virtualization, a lot of the access layer has moved into the virtual plane. Nevertheless, you have the edge and distribution and core networks uh, in um, physical hardware. And then you finally go ahead and hit the server farms where uh, you've typically virtualized. And on the servers themselves, you have uh, agents sitting on the servers for um, security purposes. So what's, uh, what are some of the issues? If you think about, we've done a good job with uh, virtualizing servers. We've done a good job with virtualizing desktops. But if you truly want to move to the cloud, we have to virtualize the entire data center, make that the unit of encapsulation and motion as you move into clouds. But if you try to do that, as you try to hoist the stacks, what remains? There's a bunch of security boxes, um, uh, route, uh, uh, networking boxes uh, at the edge. Well, that fell through quickly. Um, you have a set of uh, boxes at the edge, your firewalls, your VPN, your load balancers, your IDS, IPS. The second uh, issue with this architecture, folks have tended to net, uh, architect their networks in a fashion where you have your servers uh, act like silos. So you go all the way from the edge, your firewalls, all the way through your core networks into the server farm where you have your servers, and you tend not to mix uh, host servers that belong to different trust zones on a given uh, server farm. So that becomes an issue uh, in its own right. And the way you tend to architect that is you, 
uh, you take the devices, map that onto VLANs. When you want to cross trust zones, you have the VLAN the traffic come out through the router to get routed, and that's the point where you send um, traffic to the firewalls and the IDS, IPS devices uh, for security checks before they get on the way to the next uh, trust zone, if you will. So the problem with that architecture is these firewalls are fast becoming bottlenecks, um, and everything has to come out and back in. And if you imagine the world we're living in increasingly, your server farms are getting more and more concentrated. With uh, the tremendous amount of processing that's uh, increasingly available in your data center farms, it's clear that uh, more and more of the traffic remains within the rack. So you pretty much could have hundreds and uh, thousands of VMs sitting in the rack communicating with each other. And if you, in fact, have to uh, direct the traffic out and then back in, you're now taking what's becoming an increasingly fast and accelerated environment and having it c come out. So clearly, we need to move away from that kind of a scale-up architecture required within the core and instead move into a scale-out architecture within the rack. And that's, uh, that's one of the things you'll hear us talking about as we move uh, into this world. And, and, and some of the other um, associated issues that come about, especially as you start realizing this, moving to high scale-out clouds, is VLAN sprawl, whether it's front-end VLAN sprawl or back-end VLAN sprawl, where you go from the servers back to uh, your shared services, storage, uh, et cetera. So, so those are some of the primary issues. And at the end of the day, that's what makes it relatively hard for us to take today's current physical device-oriented scale-up architectures and move them in an agile fashion into the cloud. Let's talk about um, uh, desktop and endpoint security. There, too, uh, likewise, you have users coming in uh, from various different devices of our remote sites coming into their view desktops where you tend to have agents running on those view desktops. And then from the view desktop farm, you go on to your uh, server farm. Again, the uh, DMZ, in trying to set up view environments, we found a lot of the initial deployment time is spent trying to uh, uh, set up your firewalls, trying to set up your VPNs, trying to set up your load balancers before you even begin the task of um, uh, uh, setting up the view deployment. Uh, if you look at the agents themselves running on the guests, I think, uh, as I've stated uh, uh, before, VDI does, in fact, prove uh, tremendously useful uh, from a security architecture standpoint because the alternative is these far-flung desktops where you have no control. So VDI has definitely helped to some extent bringing in all these desktops into a common uh, virtual data center and that's where you can run common patch management tools. You can uh, put in place certain policies uh, that are good hygiene uh, policies within um, the, the data center. But nevertheless, you have other issues that have come to the fore. As you begin um, to run all these agents within the desktops next to each other, you begin to realize the inefficiencies. These inefficiencies were always there, but they were on far-flung desktops. When you begin to cram down these virtual desktops, desktops into a given server farm, you suddenly begin to realize all of these um, desktops are picking up their signature files at the same time. When they start opening up the file, they jam I.O. at the same time. CPU goes, um, uh, uh, CPU utilization goes up, detracting from what the CPU was meant to do, help the user run its apps. So, so clearly, um, AV storms and issues uh, such as signature explosion, et cetera, have shown that current security architectures within uh, the desktop itself are falling short, and there's a need for uh, a overhaul out there. So, so why is this all important? It's important because clearly the world has moved towards thinking about uh, cloud computing. Um, clearly, the benefits of cloud, the, um, the ability to be hands-off, self-service, be able to provision what you need to run your app within minutes or day, uh, within the day, versus having to call up IT and to provide services, uh, you know, weeks later, months later, that folks are increasingly becoming used to that notion. So everyone, as we talk to customers, folks are interested in moving there. It may not be right here and now today, but everyone's interested in the benefits of the cloud. 
Unfortunately, with the public cloud, there are a bunch of issues there to security and control and data privacy and uh, need to know access to services. These are the typical uh, things that come up when we talk about public clouds. So we'll talk about uh, you have this dichotomy, the existing uh, architectures, network and uh, data, uh, data uh, desktop architectures are not quite ready to go to the cloud. The public cloud is not quite ready to absorb these new apps in a secure and compliant fashion. So, so the key is, what do we do about it? You know, how can we go down the path of getting the best of both worlds uh, in an evolutionary fashion? So we've spent a lot of time within VMware thinking in terms of how we can begin the journey, uh, yet not disrupt the deployments that are going on and beginning to accelerate, if anything, and yet bring the benefits of cloud in a secure and compliant fashion. And th those are some of the things and notions that uh, I do want to talk to you about today. So um, our security strategy, uh, firstly, we believe that instead of folks going directly to the public cloud, the more important big news uh, for us is bringing the benefits of the public cloud into the private enterprise. Um, you know, some of the th uh, uh, notions of agility, some of the notions of self-service, um, on-demand, um, elasticity, bringing those to the enterprise, and that's why we talk about the evolutionary journey. We talked about private clouds, and we talk about hybrid clouds. Private clouds are essentially the notion of your ownership, but done in a cloud-like fashion. Hybrid cloud meaning you also extend to a service provider-based cloud, but do it in a fashion that is tethered. And again, we're trying to do this in a very secure fashion. Tomorrow, you'll hear at the keynotes, et cetera, this notion of secure hybrid clouds, the notion of secure private clouds. You'll hear, hear that theme a lot. But the key notion there is, instead of talking to our customers uh, about going directly to the public cloud, it's getting the benefits, whether it's locally or at a service provider near you that has embraced some of these new architectures that we're talking about. To get there, we believe, as we've gone ahead and looked at what it takes to go build um, um, private clouds, we've spent a lot of time in the industry, whether it's with Cisco's or with EMC's, the NetApp's, um, in the industry, the Cloud Security Alliance, uh, et cetera. The things that are becoming very clear are a, a few set of directives. And what I'll share with you is what it is VMware is doing in order to be able to break the logjam of moving to these secure private clouds. Firstly, we believe you have to work virtualize uh, security. Much like we uh, virtualize servers, much like we virtualize desktop, that, those were the starting points for us to be able to realize incredibly new and agile architecture. Once you move from atoms to bits, once you move from you know, metal to files, it's so much easier to then go ahead and be able to break this and encapsulate this and organize these into integrated frameworks. So we fundamentally believe that every security vendor should, in addition to their boxes and um, um, you know, uh, heavy iron kind of architectures, do embrace virtualization in one way, shape, or form, because that is the starting point. And we talk about the notion of a security VM that gets integrated into the virtual plane, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The second piece from our standpoint, once you've virtualized or you've begun the process of virtualizing security, we now have a virtualization stack we have to go ahead and secure the virtualization stack. That comes in two flavors. One is, obviously, from our own perspective, we've got to continue to make sure that our stack itself is hardened. But the second piece of it is being able to place these security VMs at important uh, boundaries in the stack. And that's what we call about uh, the securing the virtualization stack. Uh, we'll be talking a lot over the next few days about VMware's three-layer model. I'll talk about what it takes to be able to start the process of uh, integrating security into that virtualization stack. The third uh, big notion that we are introducing, the benefits of um, virtualization are incredible. Once you're able to virtualize the stack, you are for the first time be able to create malleable trust zones. It doesn't have to be tethered to your networking posture. It doesn't have to be tethered necessarily to your subnet. 
architecture. It doesn't have to be uh, tethered to your physical locations because you have access to flows, you have access to VMs, you have access to information inside VMs. So it's possible to construct a framework where you can create the trust zones the way you want to have it. And this becomes especially important as you move to uh, the cloud where you're trying to create trust zones, first of all, to separate yourself from other tenants. You, you should not even have visibility, nor should others have visibility into you in the uh, cloud data center. But likewise, the data center provider, the cloud provider, has to be separated from your important data and privacy. So it's important to have uh, the notion of trust zones. And it's imp once you have that, it's very straightforward with a virtualization like architecture to be able to create policies. And if you can unify these policies, security policies, apply those to trust zones, you will be able to uh, move forward in a much uh, more secure fashion that was earlier possible. The, the other big notion that we are introducing with the products that we have today is not we cannot create a static but non-extensible framework. So every one of the elements of security that we have introduced into the stack are being made available in a RESTful fashion. They are integrated with the vCloud APIs. So in addition to vCloud APIs for provisioning orgs and provisioning tenants and provisioning uh, VMs, you have uh, RESTful APIs to go ahead and create trust zones, uh, create firewall policy rules, uh, be able to apply them into different uh, zones, et cetera. This notion, actually, for the first time, we are beginning to see folks do some very new and innovative things in the, um, in the security world, where you can apply. You can go ahead, for example, um, uh, if you have knowledge of which um, zones out there are bad zones, or you have a, a list of malware, or you have a list of bad sites, you can go ahead and locally on your own be able to program that into your cloud fabric, into your cloud data center. So we'll talk a little bit about this. And finally, we believe, as I said earlier, that the unit of virtualization in the cloud is no longer a VM. It's the VMs plus the wiring plus the security policies with a, a parameter fence built around it. This is what we call a secure a virtual data center. So even the Burton Group and folks have introduced this notion of a virtual data center. It's the concept of VMs plus the wiring plus the um, security policy all wrapped into um, a perimeter um, wall, if you will. So those are what we believe are the important um, points that any, uh, any one of us should be worried about as we try to create secure private clouds, secure hybrid clouds, or ultimately public clouds. We think some of the notions introduced here and some of the things that people are beginning to do disruptively simplifies security. I think we've lived in a security world with lots of boxes and lots of agents, and we can see, and we have been working with uh, major players in the industry, and uh, it is becoming manifest that what's going on here is a very different uh, view into security. So let's talk about um, each of those notions in turn. The first thing we talked about, that's the necessary step, is virtualizing security. So we showed you a picture earlier, showed you a picture earlier of how it is we go about um, uh, um, um, uh, how, realizing security in the data center today. We talked about users and remote sites coming into the DMZ with your uh, web-facing apps, the interior network and um, security devices hitting the server farms where you have agents sitting on the servers and uh, the database. The first thing you'll notice here uh, versus the other picture, we've gone ahead and consolidated all of the hosts. If, if you look at a typical VMware deployment today, at least in the first phase, folks would have physically separated hosts in order to be able to keep up with the security posture so that all the way from the server, um, uh, from the servers through the host into the network, you pretty much had an air-gapped like solution. So we've gone ahead and consolidated all of the servers into, uh, uh, all of the hosts into one farm. The second thing uh, you start now beginning to consider is virtualizing all of the security functions. So let me talk through what that uh, means out here. Effectively, what we are doing now is introduce 
a virtualization plane. So we, uh, you've all seen the hypervisor and how it began to virtualize functions like CPU, memory, um, network, and storage. Now let's go ahead and use that same concept to be able to virtualize security. So we sit on top of the hypervisor, but uh, integrated into the hypervisor for functions that are inline runtime services. We've introduced this notion of a virtual plane. Now we can go ahead, first of all, move some of the agents uh, that sit on servers into that virtual plane. In fact, you'll see announcements that we make this week, uh, uh, at least with one of our partners, Trend, that actually has taken server agents and moved that into a security VM outside of the guest and, in fact, running on a per host basis. That's exactly an example of the notion that we just showed here. Likewise, you want to go ahead and start moving the firewall functions and all away from the distribution layer and into the virtual plane. The benefits of this are tremendous. Now, if you have thousands of VMs running inside your data center, thousands of VMs running in, inside your stack, you no longer have to construct VLANs, take the traffic out into the distribution layer to be able to check in with the firewall. You can keep all those policies within the virtual plane itself. Obviously, this removes choke points, and it begins to put in place a scale-out architecture, because what this means now is that if I go from three hosts to 10 hosts, 200 hosts, if I go from 100 VMs to 500 VMs to 10,000 VMs, most of the traffic remains in the virtual plane, where by, uh, f it's clear there's a lot more processing available in the data center, in the uh, rack, if you will, than on the network. We've seen a tremendous change where you used to have fast ASICs, fast processing, and scale-up architectures in the network being actually augmented and uh, um, um, you know, exceeded by the processing that's now available on uh, the server farms themselves. With processors like the Nehlems and uh, even the new processing coming out, the processing there is tremendous. So if we find a way to build scale-out architecture, scale architectures in the data center and move the functions into the virtual plane, that is a tremendous benefit. It also simplifies the architecture, the stand-up, the operations tremendously. No longer do you, when you want to stand up VMs, have to go ahead, call up the networking guy, and uh, have them carve out VLANs for you, um, and build up subnets, etc. Most of that work effectively happens in this virtual plane. And if you think about what's going on there, it's traffic the key thing with networking in this uh, paradigm, bring the traffic to the curb. Once you're in the virtual curb, uh, once you're at the virtual curb, you can now, based on authoritative knowledge, you know which VM is where, you know what ports are open, you know uh, who is trying to access that VM. You can put in a rich set of uh, security policies and functions within that virtual plane. Likewise, in the, at, the, at the web server farm itself, at the DMZ itself, is there a way to simplify? We are in the process of releasing products this week, which we'll announce uh, um, as early as tomorrow. And, and the key notion there is we can do the same thing within the DMZ itself. Again, as I talk about these architectures, I don't expect to um, see the Fortune 100s or the Fortune 500s uh, or so embrace such new architecture. This is discontinuous innovation. Typically, discontinuous innovation is first absorbed in uh, smaller areas, in less critical areas, and as people begin to get comfortable with it, uh, they begin to embrace it, and as it begins to work, it's good enough for a variety of uh, use cases, and that's what we are beginning to see happen. And so you've created the virtual plane out in the DMZ itself. You can take your load balancers, your VPN functionality, and your firewall functionality and move that to the edge. This becomes very critical, as you see, when we start moving to cloud architectures. Because ultimately, we talked about making the virtual data center be the encapsulation unit in the cloud. Those virtual data centers have an edge. Those edge services are some of the functions that we just moved into the virtual plane. That's why this, we believe, is an important um, uh, stepping stone for us to be able to realize um, uh, edge functionalities as we roll out virtual data centers in um, the cloud. Um, 
So fundamentally, you can see this, what's going on here now is we've gone ahead and virtualized agents. We've virtualized some of the interior security functions. We've virtualized some of the edge functions. What remains in this map now is primarily uh, networking gear, simplified networking gear, which means that you can take this stack that's here with your server VMs, your uh, web VMs, your security VMs, you can now encapsulate that uh, either into an OVF file or programmatically with a RESTful script. You can now move that in a much more easier fashion to another site which has a server farm ready for it, which has a vSphere on it, which has basic uh, networking on it, and you can go ahead and now go to the other side. And I'll show you in a few minutes an actual uh, working script of how we've achieved that. There are some demos um, going on. Uh, I think at 12 o'clock, uh, one of uh, the customers is actually presenting a live working system with the cloud, vCloud director, plus some of the vShields that uh, I'm showing you here today. It's all up and scripted. Effectively, the ability to make all this happen in real time, this is not science fiction. This is here and now, and some customers are already beginning to realize it, and it is an important uh, step into the cloud. So, so we talked about virtualizing. Talking about VMware stack, you'll hear a lot about the three-layered stack. There's cloud infrastructure, the cloud application platforms, and end-user computing. I think one of the things that VMware has realized over the last year, and Paul's uh, been the visionary in this regard, is that there's the cloud infrastructure, but there's the end-user experience, and there's the cloud apps. PaaS and SaaS and end-user computing is changing in a dramatic way. I mean, I can see even across this room the number of devices have gone beyond Microsoft-based devices, Windows-based, PC-based machines into iPads and Blackberries and things like that. So that has ramifications on the entire stack, and a bunch of the executives will be spending time talking about those notions. But effectively, we have those three stacks, the cloud infrastructure, so effectively the vSphere that you know and love is evolving to becoming a cloud uh, infrastructure, if you will. And on top of that, we are beginning to pay close attention into the applications and how they get stitched into that underlying fabric. And then you have the management and orchestration that cuts across each of these layers. If you look at uh, what that uh, all means at the cloud infrastructure level, effectively we had vSphere, which is virtualizing compute storage and uh, networking. And on top of that, you virtualize desktops and virtualize servers. We are now with uh, things like vCloud Director and even some of the stuff going on with the vShield, we are beginning to have infrastructure as a service become the deliverable of this cloud infrastructure. On top of that, we have cloud applications, um, and that's evolving dramatically. Uh, while there is a world out there that's completely running your existing applications, I call them existing enterprise tier one apps, there's an entire new emerging set of applications that are uh, getting modified big time, and um, that world is evolving at an incredible pace. And uh, some of the initiatives we have going on with Spring Source and all, uh, if that's an area of interest to you, there's so much um, uh, innovation going on in that area, and it's changing the way we look at some of uh, these stacks. Um, so that is the middle layer, and what's the ultimate um, uh, product of this layer? It's either platform as a service, but more importantly, the application as a service. At the end of the day, it's all about connecting the end user to the app, and our belief is ultimately this layer beneath becomes like a big x86 processor. It's a virtual 86, a v86 processor, if you will. It's our job, us as producers, the world will get divided into the providers and the consumers. So at the end of the day, uh, at the upper layers, it's about consuming apps. And uh, underneath the apps, it's all about producing what it takes in a, trans in a transparent fashion to support these apps. And finally, um, as we talked about, you have this variety of devices, and it's about a unified experience. So what's that mean from a security perspective? And the way we are looking at it is the following. We believe um, you know, compliance um, and security management, ultimately things will get a lot more simplified from your um, governance and risk and control. You'll have a set of policies which in turn will dictate the kind of security posture you want to take across this entire stack. 
and the results of applying those policies will result in events that go into your management plane. If you think about all the different security areas that are of uh, importance and interest, all the way from uh, the bottommost part of the stack, you have TrustSec. We're spending time with uh, Intel and RSA, for example, to build a complete chain of trust, a root of trust uh, from hardware through um, the hypervisor uh, to being able to calibrate and measure. The whole idea being, as you start going into these lights out cloud environments, uh, from afar, you should be able to know uh, and trust that, in fact, the piece of hardware, its hypervisor, the operating system, the base are, in fact, what you thought it was to begin with. It was not compromised. So that's the trust like world. Endpoint security, addressing server and desktop VM, uh, moving the agents out. Virtual infrastructure security, all of the other containers, whether it's networking containers, whether it's, um, um, uh, whether it's clusters or hosts, that uh, level of virtual infrastructure security. Then your apps and their data, we're spending time um, uh, with data privacy, uh, data loss prevention, uh, encryption in this layer and then application security. At the end of the day, this is where it uh, really hits the road. You want to make sure that uh, access to apps is done on a need-to-know basis. You want to make sure that it's completely protected uh, from the network. You want to make sure that the data it touches is done so in a fashion where there's no leakage, that only the right uh, set of folks have access to the data. Even the cloud provider should not have access to the data. And, uh, and above that layer, at the edge, this is where as different devices and folks come into your SaaS or PaaS uh, apps, this is where the edge set of services are uh, put in place. So that's our vision across the entire VMware stack. Uh, by no means are we close to being able to address all of these needs today. So, so what we've um, identified is uh, what we want to have done across the stack in the next few years, we've begun to identify partners in each of these areas and are bringing these together in a cohesive, unified fashion because we fundamentally believe we have to be able to address all of these issues mentioned here. Security is one of these um, uh, things like integration, like management, that get woven into every layer of the stack. Security is um, not one of those bolt-on kind of things. It's got to be built into the stack. And to do that, uh, we have to take a leadership role as VMware, at least for the VMware stack, to be able to create a framework into which to deploy uh, these policies. And so that's, that's, the, um, um, uh, that's the direction there. So that was the vision, specifically now in terms of what it is we are realizing and announcing uh, today. You have uh, the management, the vCenter, the vSphere uh, platform virtualizing. This is uh, stuff you know. Um, you have your server VM stack. You have your desktop VM stack. The, the first thing from our standpoint, we talked about the need for virtualizing security. What we are doing, at least for a baseline set of functions, virtualizing security in what we call vShield VMs. Why the word vShield? I think from our standpoint, vShields are a virtual version of firewalls. Firewalls are a little more static. You erected these in place, and pretty much people built silos with the firewalls in mind. With Shields, it's a lot more dynamic. It's a scale-out architecture. These are a lot smaller. Uh, these tend to be closer to the servers. These tend to be virtualized. These tend to be deployed on demand um, in a scale-out fashion. So that's why we've branded a lot of the things that we're doing with security and trying to achieve with security under the moniker of vShields. So that's the first step, virtualizing security into vShield VMs. The second piece is now beginning to insert um, security into our stack. The first area, as you can imagine, is trying to protect the applications, trying to protect the endpoints. And the way we do that is by inserting security VMs on top of the vSphere platform on a per host basis but it begins to look like one distributed virtual firewall. Just like uh, we introduced the notion of a distributed virtual switch a couple of years ago, which uh, made it look like one continuous set of ports across a cluster. You didn't really have to worry about on which particular 
um, host, a port was homed, or a VNIC was homed, the virtual distributed switch made that transparent to you. Likewise, think of this as a distributed virtual firewall, uh, but it's realized with virtual shields, but the net effect is the same. And the second big piece is um, all these server VMs get encapsulated and wired into the virtual data center. That's where you need an edge device, and that's where we have a V-Shield edge uh, security VM uh, that's uh, released this week. And finally, we have to bring it all together. Uh, at the end of the day, folks are not as interested in the actual policy enforcement points as much as they're interested in the service. So every one of these services are ultimately made transparent and uh, abstracted, if you will, into the vShield manager. So what that means is, whether it's a cloud director, the Redwood project, uh, whether it's a third-party cloud provider, your service provider um, uh, running scripts, they all come in through the vShield Manager RESTful APIs, and the vShield Manager in turn transparently goes ahead and um, uh, does its thing and realizes these into policies that are going to be enforced on the edge or on an endpoint or in the application zone. And I'll show you what that means. So we talked about inserting these security VMs into the stack. The other big notion we talked about is the notion of trust zones. So that is a little more straightforward. Uh, we believe if you can abstract all of these things you're protected into zones, it begins to um, um, shortcut or shorthand a bunch of notions, and then you can apply the policies to the zones. Some of the more obvious zones are securing a VM, and that's where, for example, our endpoint uh, strategy is based around. Secondly, securing an app, because these VMs are not in isolation. There are some relationships between them, a web tier, an app tier, a database tier. And finally, the notion of a virtual data center, where you not only have multiple apps, they might be multiple tiered, but you might have local networks, you might have policies for coming into or out of a given uh, trust zone, even within the virtual data center, and then the inside-outside policies that you want to attach to the virtual data center. And then finally, th while those first three notions are things that we come up with, invariably we can never predict or never meet the need of the customer base. You might want a completely orthogonal view of your data center. For example, you might have run a data loss prevention routine, and it might have found that certain uh, uh, virtual machines across your enterprise had critical uh, sensitive data. You might want to put that into a zone called sensitive zone. Or you might have uh, a web bot service that uh, earmarks a set of IPs as bad IPs or bad emails. You might want to classify them into the bad zone. Or you might want to have a quarantine zone. Um, it's, not, um, uh, it's not for us to decide what that is. So we've uh, given you the tools to be able to go ahead on the five program your own zones, whether it's the output from another policy or whether it's a manual process that you run um, and set up. So those are the zones. The second piece is applying the policies, and this is where us and our partners have been working together. We want to create this unified framework. We've talked about virtualizing everything. Now what? Once you virtualize, there are opportunities for us to go and homogenize and unify, and that's exactly what we're doing. So you have edge functions, uh, application security functions, VM functions. Uh, See, so at the edge, you have things like firewalls and VPNs and um, you know IPAM uh, for IP address management. On your app side, your firewalls and monitoring kind of uh, functions. Likewise, on the endpoint, you have um, uh, AV and uh, DLP-like functions. So those are what I call your um, uh, policy enforcement points, where we recommend that you map these on to security VMs and move these into security VMs. So if you're the industry's leading IDS IPS vendor, you would map that on to a security VM for IDS IPS. Now the second piece is um, uh, administering those policies because while these policies are actually enforced, for example, an edge policy is deployed on the network, an endpoint policy is deployed introspectively on, uh, uh, on guest resources. The vShield manager tries to t take a look at it from a very different uh, viewpoint. It abstracts. It's a service. I want to be able to apply AV policy for a trust zone um, that uh, may be outside of my data center. 
I may uh, want to apply a policy that says M&A um, zone. The only people that can see traffic there is folks that belong to the M&A uh, group, uh, for example. So that's, that's the layer that abstracts and administers all of um, these policies. Again, we're doing a lot of work there to be able to take advantage of new uh, emerging scale-out architectures like message buses, uh, et cetera, within the, uh, within the virtual fabric. Because you can imagine, you might have one virtual uh, V-Shield manager in a cloud fabric managing each of these different um, policy enforcement points, some of which are coming from different vendors. So that layer of abstraction and uh, um, conversion into runtime policies is a very important piece. And as I said earlier, all of these are now being explicated as RESTful APIs which in turn are taken advantage of, not just by the vCenter client. So in the, in the products that are being released this week, you have a vCenter plugin, a VI client plugin. You have vCloud Director that's integrated with our Edge services. We have customers writing automation scripts, whether it's a Perl script, a Ruby script, a Python script, or whatever your favorite language is, you can write to the RESTful uh, API. It's a very straightforward thing to do. And then these are also the layers where uh, you can go ahead and talk to your security information event manager and compliance stacks. So we're doing work with folks like RSA to be able to create this kind of a stack. So this is what we're trying to do from an abstraction and unification policies applied to a zone standpoint. And you'll see the first um, uh, incarnations, if you will, of this architecture in the products that are coming out this week. So let's talk about the products that are coming out. Um, um, we are announcing three products, VShield Edge 1.0 which secures the edge of the virtual data center. It has functions like firewall, um, NAT, uh, DHCP, VPN, and load balancer built in. Um, you have vShield App 1.0, which builds on the concept of zones. Zones and vShield Manager continue to be uh, part of the vSphere family, but on top of that, we are introducing vShield App 1.0, which is based on DB filter, uh, based on the VM safe APIs, inserts itself in the IO chains on the ports of a V switch. So you're doing fast processing. But increasingly, there's more and more app awareness. Um, uh, this year, we don't have identities built into it. You'll see us begin to do that next year, for example. But that's a vShield App 1.0 product. And finally, the vShield Endpoint 1.0, where we are able to move uh, um, agents away from guests and run that in a security VM. Um, and that's what we're announcing, with Trend Micro being the first instantiation of that uh, strategy. So those are three products, vShield Edge 1.0, App 1.0, and Endpoint 1.0, which comprehensively try to address the needs from an end-to-end -end basis. We believe all of these, as I said earlier, are important as we move to the cloud. So um, uh, let's talk about each of these uh, very briefly. Uh, there are detailed sessions for those of you interested uh, in each of these topics on endpoint security. I believe tomorrow, Marius and uh, Dean will be talking about the notion. But the notion is pretty straightforward, if you can imagine. Up, up to now, we used to have the agents running on each of the guests. Effectively, what we've done is insert um, a layer, an um, uh, interception layer, into each of the guests, and that you don't have to worry too much about it. It's inserted into VM tools, and there's a fast uh, introspection um, hypervisor-based plane that makes all of the important um, um, events become available to the security VM, where the third party, where the AV vendor, like a trend, but we are also working ultimately with the McAfee's and semantics of the world um, out there, the idea is instead of each of these VMs getting the signature file and processing and doing I.O., the signature files, et cetera, come down to the security VM and all the processing when a file is opened on demand, on access scans, are done out in the security VM. This has tremendous savings in terms of footprint on the guest, in terms of I.O. Uh, disruption on the guest, in terms of A.V. storm. So you can imagine this, in fact, I think... Uh, 
um, I think the world, as you begin to architect your um, security solutions in this fashion, it's a better architecture to begin with, regardless of virtualization. You do not want to be able to um, run your CPU to 90% doing nothing but uh, AV. You should have a lot more control on your CPU in the guest for the purpose of running apps and let the security functions be given their own um, resources on the side. So this is what we are excited about that uh, particular uh, release of products. It's up and running, so feel free to take a look at that. I uh, suspect Trend has their booth up and running. There will be uh, presentations on this. The second piece on the network side, what's the big news here with the vShield app? Uh, you had, this is, your, like I said earlier, your typical architecture. Most companies that we used to go to would deploy their trust zones on a per-host basis. But the problem with this architecture is you might have two or th the need for two or three VMs here, but the need for uh, 20 VMs here. And you tend not to be able to take advantage of your consolidation ratios and all because of security purposes, because you're going back to the VLAN, which goes back to the firewall. So you're not, uh, security is coming in the way of true consolidation and agility. So, uh, so what uh, can we do about it? With the vShield zones, we are sitting in the network and I have the ability to have you move your VMs into trust zones um, across the host. Not only that, you can mix trust zones on a given host. You know, I mean, for those of you who, uh, who, for who this rubs the wrong way, you can take it uh, in smaller steps, you know, for doing it for areas that are not as critical to begin with. But much like you ultimately uh, ran multiple VMs on a server, you can run multiple uh, servers, uh, multiple trust zones on a given host. So the important thing is the security policy follows the VM, and you have mixed trust zones. So... Um, so now, talking about Edge itself, uh, let me uh, talk to you about how this happens in the cloud. This is pretty exciting. Everything we're talking about here, all these policies and all, at the end of the day, reduced down to a script. When we first started um, this exercise, it would take a while to go create virtual data centers. We are now down to a point where you can create the entire virtual data center in 10 minutes. In fact, as part of our testing and all, we've done things like stand up and down thousand virtual data centers in a day. Um, some of our customers even getting ready for VMworld. There are a couple of demos here going on that are actually utilizing these concepts. So again, this is here and now and achievable. But the idea here is the following. Um, you have an automated VDC script written in your favorite language, all taking advantage of the RESTful APIs that are part of the vCloud and the vShield. So the first thing that you do when you get, and, and what I'm talking about here, this script is created by writing to the vCloud um, APIs, the vCloud APIs, the vShield APIs, and some of the vCenter APIs. The combination is what allows you to stand up a virtual data center on demand. So how does it work? First thing you want to do is create a provider VDC where you get your resource pools for CPU, MEM, and storage, and you get two port groups. One is an internal port group, and one is an external port group. The second thing that you want to do is set up the parameter services. The way you do that now is set up the uh, vShield Edge with its external interface on the external port group and its internal uh, interface on the internal port group. You can now go ahead and add the services that come with the vShield Edge. So you can turn on your port firewall rules. You can turn on a load balancer with an external virtual IP with IPs behind it. You can also set up an IPsec VPN for access into this. Now you can map. You can go to vCloud and map the org VDC because you have the, no look, you have the notion of a virtual data center looking at it from the provider perspective, but you have the notion, notion of a virtual data center looking at it from an org perspective. So now that org pay perspective is mapped on to the provider perspective so that uh, uh, the consumer and the provider have this tight linkage. What do you do now? You set up your, um, you create your map, you, you got your organization VDC, you provision your vApps, you moved some VMs out there, you attach some of the DMZ VMs directly um, into the internal uh, interface on the vShield edge. So that gives you access. Now let's go and start carving out. So this is good. This is your typical thing that you might find on an Amazon where you have a VPC concept with multiple VPCs running in the cloud. But that's not 
yet enterprise grade. How do you make it enterprise grade and create internal policies? That's where the VShield app now starts coming to play, where we can break this up into further zones inside. So to do that, install the VShield app on a per host basis, and each of these VShield apps have attached via DV filter into the vSwitch fabric. The next thing you do is now for example, you can create access to shared services. So from inside a virtual data center, typically you might want to attach into your, um, uh, into your NTP server or into a backup server. That can come in through simple rules. You took that port group and set up a set of policies to be able to access certain IPs. You can go further, and now let's say what you're interested in doing is take this DMZ app, uh, DMZ app and DB tiers and carve these out into different port groups. That's exactly what you can do with the vShield app without having to burn up VLANs. You might have had the overall uh, port group backed up by a VLAN, but within that port group, we can allow you to segment this with within the port groups, within the uh, data center into each of the tiers without burning up VLANs. And now what you have effectively done is broken up your data center into uh, a multi-tiered app with policies that are applicable within uh, this structure. So there you have it. This whole VDC, it's actually scripts that are up and running. We've worked this out with some of the cl cloud providers. We are enterprises up and running. So at the end of the day, what you have now is you've got the ability to create these encapsulated VDCs and stand them up on demand. A vSphere VDC, a Vue VDC, remotely you can go to an external cloud and have secure VPN connectivity. You can sp stand up a Spring cloud. So here's the idea. You can completely encapsulate, automate, script, move, um, get to the private cloud. And this is exactly what are the kinds of things we are trying to unleash out there. So to summarize uh, my last slide here, we've gone from a world where you had air-gapped pods, you know, where you, uh, security was this afterthought and you um, uh, constructed your architecture uh, to be able to have uh, air-gapped pods, to now introducing mixed trust zones. Finally, we're moving to a world where you have secure hybrid clouds. So that's, that's the rationale, that's the thinking, that's what we have been working on over the last couple of years. We hope, um, um, we hope um, you appreciate and get a chance to take a look at these products, and we hope some of you get a chance to deploy them shortly. Thank you. Thank you.